All right. For the audience that doesn't know you, feel free to introduce yourself. Hello, folks. My name is Tommy G. I am a documentary filmmaker, and I get you inside access to places you probably either have never seen for yourself or you haven't heard of. So talk to me about yourself. What was the moment you realized I need to become a journalist? Was it for fun or the ideology? Hmm. <clears throat> I always have had a genuine curiosity about the world, and I always wanted to do journalism in some form. I remember being in college watching Vice documentaries, but thinking, I don't have the credentials, I don't have the degree, I don't have the experience, so this is a world that I do not participate in. And I've taken adventures, uh, I mean, I, I live with a tribe in the, in the jungle of Ecuador and I was a sophomore in college. I've always liked to travel and see the world. And so I always kind of had this innate sense that I want to adventure, explore, question, and just figure things out. And I just kind of stumbled into it. I thought, you know, we're, we're living in an era of media now where you can be the premier interviewer on the planet. I can be the premier documentary guy simply because the rule book is getting thrown out of the window. The credentials no one cares about. And so here I am making documentaries for a living when really, if you look, judge me by the, the traditional sense, I have no business doing it. All right. So let's get let's get like really deep into something like mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. So squeeze bends. So he for the audience that doesn't know who squeeze bends is which you have to be living under a rock to not know um you know squeeze bends was this one of the most wanted drivers in new york for a very long time very notorious man yeah infamous like everybody knew who he was like kids were talking about it at school um i live in jersey so you know it also kind of makes sense i actually knew a girl that knew him in high school which was an interesting story um because once he got arrested his mugshot pulled up and everyone was like oh i know this guy yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and he's been doing it since high school apparently according to that one girl that i knew um but anyways you know he was basically the premier driver of new york like yeah. he would go on all these cop chases he was with neon who allegedly got him arrested i have no idea if that's true but talk to me about him and how and about the arrest one of the goals of the channel is to meet with one of one characters and people that are particularly notorious or interesting or just do things, kind of live the outlaw lifestyle. And Squeeze Benz embodies that to the full. And as far as him get arrested, I think what happened was, okay, so one thing that's very important with how I film with people, uh, they see a copy of the video, I know how to disguise their voice, I make sure that if their face needs to be covered up, if a location needs to be covered up, I take that very seriously because this person is inviting me into their world and my job is to protect them and because it's it's all you know gravy for me when the video gets posted and i get to go back to milwaukee but i want to make sure that whether i'm talking to a fentanyl dealer a driver whoever it is that they are protected and um so i take that seriously but he kind of he went on a media tear after that video and i have a hunch that some of the guys he filmed with weren't nearly as careful as how they did the episode and i think it probably got him tripped up I also think he was a busy man, we'll just say that. And um, sometimes when you're really busy, sometimes things catch up to you. So I don't know the exact story. Uh, I do. I am in contact with some of his people and uh, they say he's doing okay and they have a plan for him to get out. But um, it was unfortunate to see that news for sure. Well, now let's talk about another guy that you made famous, uh, made famous. They were already kind of famous, but you skyrocketed them. Uh, Punch made deaf. So, hmm. and I, yeah, you, you kind of did a giggle there. Um, kids in my school, like people I've spoken to, they kind of look down on him. They're like, oh, he's not real. Like, and then everything I, cause squeeze bench was real. Like everything about him was real. But punch made dev, everything I hear about him is all, oh, this was fake. And he's not a real scammer. He's, he's a scammer who scams scammers by like, you know, the classic, I'm going to tell you how to scam people and then not give you really what you want sort of scam um in his telegram chats so talk to me about him punch made dev is another one of those characters that when you meet him you're just like holy shit i can't believe i'm talking to this guy because he to me the way he portrays himself is kind of this super villain character and like every time you would give him a chance to redeem himself because like when i go into these situations i'm not like oh you scam the world beautiful how awesome is that like i ask him tough questions but every question i would ask him that would kind of 
lead to redemption. He he answered and he would double down on the villain arc. And so I thought that was an interesting trait about him. But I, what I can tell you about Punch May Dev is this. One, he's a very intelligent guy. I think he's an amazing marketer. And I think he kind of lives in the world of smoke and mirrors. And so I'm not the most qualified computer guy. You know, some of the stuff he was doing was passing my sniff test. But I've also heard, like, he makes a, a the majority of his coin telling people about the scam, selling the sauce, and then blocking them on Instagram or Telegram or however he does it. And um, I think you got to look. I mean, this is this is what my lawyer says, that if he was true, because he commented on that video and he had one of the top comments, if he was truly scamming Bank of America like that, it doesn't last forever. So I think he's crafty. I think he's mysterious. I think he knows enough about that world. Maybe he did it at one point, but I think he's smart enough not to get himself in prison. I would almost compare it to a Tupac where, um, cause Tupac, most people don't know this, but I think with him, he went to private school. Like he went to like a really good school and he was a good student and he then he acting classes. Right. Yeah. And he's like the total opposite of a gangster. And here he is rapping about, you know, money and hoes. And, and he has thug life tattooed on his stomach. Yeah. But you know, I look at him like a similar way I would look at uh, Mabu, a similar way I would look at maybe Takashi 6 9 People that are that know that to stand out in today's rap world, you have to be an excellent marketer and at branding yourself. And I look at these guys in a similar similar way I would look at Trump, like people that have just made themselves like kind of shrouded in mystery or controversy and use it to their advantage. So from there, let's talk more about the footage that you get, right? So has there ever, and I know you have a Patreon where you have like the more uncensored stuff. Yeah. Um, I have yet to subscribe, but has there ever been footage that you've had to cut out because it was just too much on both ends? Yeah, plenty of it. Oftentimes I do. Part of it is because the guy I'm working with said, you know what? I gave up too much information or we showed this location and I, I can't have that happen. And I respect that uh, part of it because of, how youtube guidelines work there's not i just can't show everything and part of it like i'll protect people like you know i might be dealing with the guy who maybe younger gangster type guys that think they can just show a switch to the camera and i know that that's an in instant federal case and so i will blur that we know what to look for to protect the guys that we work with as much as possible and there's also an element of there's video ideas out there that we could get access to, but there is a dark side of the world that it's almost not even worth looking into or exposing because you just invite so much trouble into your life to do so. Going from there, um, when you're talking about like people carrying switchblades and like kind of putting those no, switches, switches, switches is a piece that you add to your gun to make it fully automatic. Oh, I thought you were talking about like switchblades, but they're also illegal um, yes. in most places. Um, which is also terrible, but going from there, talking to me about the most evil person that you met doing this, like somebody that what you don't think was playing a part, like they were just this really, really despicable person. George, that's one interesting thing on this journey that I've learned is previously as an outsider, you would think like a lot of these guys are evil, but I have yet to meet anybody I would really consider to be evil. I've met people that have sold fentanyl that have killed people that if I didn't know that, I'd be like, oh, I would invite this guy to a dinner because he'd be interesting and my friends would like him. Uh, a lot of it, too, comes from messed up upbringings and lack of education. I mean, even a, a pimp that I was recently talking to, you would think this guy is just a total bad character. But there's, I find in almost everyone there's a redeemable likable aspect and you might not agree with what they do or you might think it's wrong or it's despicable and some of them they really are but somewhere in there there's a person that you're like oh i kind of like this guy kind of like this guy well going from there you know when we're talking about evil and like the actions that a lot of these guys are committing mm -hmm. have you ever you know Actually, you know, let me skip to this question instead, because uh, I do have a list of questions and sure. there's also things I just want to follow up with. But 
after you know visiting some of the most violent criminals you know dangerous areas um, in the united states what do you really think the country needs like what do you what do you see as like the ultimate thing that the country really needs some people say it's father figures you know which is like a super general one um some people say we need better laws but what does tommy think i don't think there's going to be any one silver bullet thing to solve for but i do agree that family structure really matters if the more people that can be brought up in a family that the mom and dad love each other support each other and are raising the kids together a family that is encouraging reading and education a family that holds certain standards like you shouldn't be stealing you shouldn't be doing xyz um i think another thing that i see i was in a prison i was in the biggest prison in texas recently and that episode will come out in december and i was just surrounded by all these guys and most common crime was murder there's robbers there's other things but most common crime was murder i said guys raise your hands how many of you grew up you know just with your mom most of them raise your hand how much how many of you grew up in poverty everyone there was not one rich kid that was like a preppy suburban kid that was in that prison and so i do think there is a recipe towards criminality it doesn't excuse it or doesn't say it's okay but I would say there's a lot of places where the entire economy of the area has just been sucked out. So, for example, in Milwaukee, there used to be a very thriving middle class on the north side, which is the predominantly black side of town. Milwaukee is a segregated area for the most. I mean, it's, some parts has been known as the most segregated city in America. We have a side with us, the black side, the Latino side and the white side. And there used to be a thriving black side where there was a wall, black Wall Street, they called it. And there was tons of manufacturing and, and auto jobs. All of that went overseas. And then all of a sudden, you know, you start to see a shift. And then the other thing is mass incarceration. And I'm not saying guys should just get out for nothing, but I don't know. When you lock up, when you lock up an 18-year-old kid for 20 years for a murder, that it wasn't a diabolical murder, it was a revenge murder. Someone shot his people, they shot his people. I don't really know if that's, I mean, it's hard to say how many years someone deserves to give up of their life. And so anyways, from a few different factors, you see the degradation of the family and it's evident. And now the result right now is you have loads of 15, 14, 16 year old kids running around with shifty masks and guns and their moms at work, sometimes working two jobs, trying to keep a roof over the family. And they're kind of running amok because no parent is really at home to say anything. And we've gotten to a point where there's not really community parenting anymore. Back in the day, if I did something wrong, you know, Mrs. Nicholas would tell me that was wrong and she would tell my mom that was wrong. But now we're so scared of these 15 year old kids that they, we don't say anything. We let them kind of just do what they're gonna do. Cause well, I'm not gonna say something one, because I don't wanna cause an altercation and I don't wanna get shot. And then two, because it's, I guess it's not my place anymore. And we've lost that connective tissue. So I think it's been a few factors, but education parenting economic opportunities i would say those are the top of the list so as, as a parent yourself right because you have a wonderful young baby boy yes yeah. okay you have a nice young baby boy mm -hmm. and you know i assume that as a parent you want the best for your kid now after having to deal with or you know meet with i should say kids that are like 14 significant like even younger than me right and that are dealing drugs you know breaking into cars like everything a parent i assume would not want for their kid you know right. unless your dad's al capone but yeah. you know for the most part most parents are not crime bosses so in general what lessons have you taken from you know the kids that you've met that have gone horribly wrong um in some way or another that you kind of want to like the lessons that you take from that as a parent, right? Like if it has all at all changed your way of parenting. Even these kids that are complete menaces, and I've met plenty of them. Like I just was in Latin King territory in Chicago a couple of days ago, and I saw, it looks like a 10 or 11 year old wearing a rubber glove. I don't know if that was for shooting to avoid fingerprints or for stealing stuff. But I mean, these kids were doing, they were doing bad stuff. But I'm looking at these kids, I'm like, you're 10 or 11 years old. like what what is how badly has your household failed you that you are out here with a ski mask and who knows what in your little gangster purse and with your gloves on 
like how has your household failed you so to me it's about having a place for people to direct their energy in a positive way because i really believe that if you don't direct in a positive way it's going to come out in a bad way and so one big thing for me is investing in like for instance getting kids into wrestling or jujitsu or boxing or a sport that they love so they can push that energy in a good direction so my job as a, as a father is to find out what my kid loves to do and then encourage and support and be there for them to to embrace those opportunities because i would guess these kids that we're seeing in the street with rubber gloves on i don't think they're dad one if he's even in the picture i'd be surprised but i don't think he's thinking about how can i get my kid involved in chess club or boxing or they're they're fending for themselves so just that my presence is very important and not take it for granted to i mean because i could be traveling endlessly with this job but to be home as much as possible to be engaged as much as possible and even the little things like one family thing that we have as a ritual right now is swim lessons my, my boy is 10 months old he's not actually swimming but we're just getting him used to the water and it's a family thing that me and my wife get in the pool with him the instructor's there and it's a lot of it is just pure joy seeing the smile as, as he's gliding through water or learning how to you know paddle or kick his legs and not taking those moments for granted knowing that one day he will be grown in a blink of an eye and if i didn't have the chance to impact him then that's on me and that's going to be a failure i'll remember what's an unnoticed or under talked about problem you know having been through everywhere basically and seeing all the problems what do you think there if at all there's a problem that people just don't talk about enough reading the fact how many how little how, how few percentage of people actually read is a huge one to me. And I think the good news is podcasts have grown in popularity. So a lot of people are listeners. So I think those are very valuable tools for learning. But to me, uh, if someone isn't listening to podcasts and reading, they're missing out on a lot of opportunity for self-education. And at the end of the day, like we can ask the government to do more. We can ask the schools to do more. But really, in your family unit, if you can encourage a curiosity in the world to read to learn to discover they're probably going to be okay they're probably going to figure it out and they're probably going to find something that they're interested in so i would say like if i was a dictator we're, we're people are reading books we're we're going to read more books so this is a topic i actually feel very strongly about because i actually started reading recently again yes. um in the past couple months and i'll tell you why i stopped um, it's funny because as a kid, I read like 300 pages a day. Like I read a book in a day and then I stopped. And my logic was I could just look up a summary online and that would be good enough. It's not. Um, or I could just What's listen. Saying when you travel that you can just look up, oh, I want to travel to China. I'm just going to look up a video of it. And that right. suffices, you know? Well, I have a much grosser way of putting it. It's kind of like if somebody chewed up steak and then spit it into your mouth, like, you know, you're still getting the food, but. You know, it, you're really not the journey, the adventure. Right. That you've gone. Yes, correct. So going from there, um, why actually, well, let me ask you this question first. Book recommendations. One book that I recommend to everyone that's in the creative pursuit is Turning Pro by Stephen Pressfield. To me, that's like the Bible of creative pursuits and the philosophy of how to think about it and how to weather the storm of the ups and downs that you'll inevitably encounter um but i also love fiction i think like a, a i grew up in the era where people would camp out to get the next harry potter book and i think that was really cool like the fact that a lady that was formerly you know broke and in, in, in a tough life in england all of a sudden wrote a series that just connected to millions and millions of people around the planet to me was really cool so I mean, the harry potter series is great for a kid um and then i also like biography so the three that i always Oh, I had four. four. Four that I really like to recommend would be Teddy Roosevelt, Benjamin Franklin, Malcolm X, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. People that have lived larger than life, they treat life like a, a grand old adventure a lot in some in a lot of cases, I would say, and really wore a lot of hats. I think that's another cool thing is the Roman view of 
of life, which is you can be the businessman, you can be the senator, you can be the husband, you can be the warrior. We're not stuck in some box. You know, you get your degree, you're an electrical engineer, and all of a sudden you have to be that for the rest of your life. Like there's a lot of hats you get to wear in this life. Talk to me about why people get into crime, right? I mean, I know the obvious reasons. Some people need to put food on the plate. You know, some people do it for the thrill. But is there anything other than that? Like, is, what's the real cause that makes somebody go, oh, you know, maybe I should break into cars? Because I don't I don't have that urge. As, at least I think I'm, part yeah. of it is a sense of hopelessness that there's not an opportunity for them in life. <laughs> there's no clear path they can see besides that so they make fast money enjoy it in the moment i mean we're talking about a lot of these criminals they're not making a year-long plan of well, by the time i'm 50 i want to be doing xyz it's a day-to-day -day existence survival and so but then i also have met guys that are in it for the thrill they love stealing cars they could easily they're smart enough that they could easily be doing it or engineering but these guys, they, they, the thrill of being in a high-speed chase must be unbelievable. The thrill of running into a dealership in the middle of the night, using a car to smash the window, getting in there, stealing a, a charger, an SRT, it must be intoxicating. So, and then there's, there's, I think a lot of it too would be poverty. You're willing to do a lot more things when you have nothing. Rents do. You haven't eaten all day. I think, yeah, I think they're they're the obvious replicas or examples of just people wanting to survive and what they're willing to do. So going on this lesson, you know, sort of topic, to finalize it, what's the biggest lesson that you have learned making your videos, if one? I would say not to judge people. Uh, there's a great Bible verse I love that's roughly along the lines of why point out the speck in someone else's eye when there's a plank in your own. And to an extent, we're we're guilty of nearly everything that we'd be ma mad about someone else. So and it, might, and it might might not be as extreme, but we've probably done something like that's a shade of what we're mad about within someone else. And that's not to excuse people or to just be like, do whatever you want. You do have to draw your lines in the sand, but as I've gotten to sit down with people and talk to them and connect with them, I've learned not to judge people as much. So, um, actually, here would be the final question for the advice part. Do you have any advice for young people? Be very experimental, be very curious. And I would say get out there and try a lot of things. It might take a lot of pivots or adjustments to figure out what you're on this earth for, or what you're meant to do in this particular chapter of your life, but you're not gonna find enlightenment or your path by being on TikTok all day. Join a club, learn a new language, buy a plane ticket to somewhere else, try and shadow someone in a job that you like, read about someone that you find interesting, get out there. That's what I would say. Now, switching gears, talk to me about some of the offers you've gotten, right? Talk to me about, because I you tell in all of your videos, you know, oh, I get like hundreds of offers, or at least in Julian's, Julian's interview, I remember you mentioning that you get tons and tons of offers. You get most of this through like tips and, you know, people emailing, oh, you know, interview me or interview about this topic, like sort of like a software underbelly, because that's, that's how I know he does it too. Um, so talk to me about like the most interesting offers that you've gotten and had to turn down. Well, if they're the most interesting, I'm certainly not trying to turn them down. I would say to me, it's who can get me inside access to a world that is very hard to get into. So for example, in a week, I'm driving to Memphis. And I'm going to be with an undercover drug task force guy on a raid. And it's like, holy crap. Like if I get an invitation like that, I'm going to make it there somehow. I would say the majority of them are, yo, come to my hood next. And there's only so many of those you can do. Also, I would say I want to have a very diversified portfolio. I want to have 
where you can't predict what the next video is going to be. And for instance, I just got off a call with a billionaire who is in the military industrial world, but he's kind of an anti-hero in that world. So uh, if I can get on the calendar with him, you can bet that I'm going to be following him for a day. The most compelling way to get my attention is to have a clear path of how that person messaging me is going to get me into a place that I wouldn't be able to get into myself. A lot of them, most of the messages I get are like poorly written and don't lead to much. But if someone can give me a compelling, like, here's this, this, and this, and I can do this, like, okay, I'm on the phone with you today. So going from there, you know, I know you did a video on the black Israelites, which is yeah. basically a cult. Um, yes. you know, so which, you know, for the audience that doesn't know, they're basically a hate, uh, a hate group slash cult that is religiously against white people. Um, for the, Some moment. Of the most delusional, funny guys, unintentionally funny people I've ever met. Right. It's basically the black KKK. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how talk to me about cults, right? Cults are a fascinating topic because they don't operate. They don't intend to operate like a criminal gang, but they do, right? Sometimes, right? There's a lot of overlap between them and, you know, dictatorships and criminal organizations, but they're kind of their own thing for the most part, right? Because they're not trying to get money. Sometimes they are. You know, you get the famous quote by L. Ron Hubbard, you know, if you want to get rich, you don't write science fiction, you start religion. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about cults and what you've learned from the people that join them the people that make them, uh, more importantly. To me, what's really an interesting question is how humans come to believe particular things. And to see a group of a few dozen men believing some of the most wild things that I've ever heard in my life, where it's kind of like, okay, like you, you're you in on the joke too, aren't you? But they're kind of not in on the joke. Like I think a lot of them actually believe that. That just to me is the, is the interesting component. And we even see it politically, like a good chunk of the country cannot understand how the other chunk of the country thinks and vice versa. And it's causing a lot of problems with us and, and it's keeping us from uniting. But speaking on the aspects of a cult, I guess one thing that always blows my mind is how that like the one guy like I, the general yahana was the character in this one like he is the final word and everything he said you would have thought was like a nobel peace prize speech because all of his guys were hyping him up even if it was the dumbest thing i've ever heard and i guess because i know someone that's kind of in the QAnon cult space and i think another defining characteristic of a call is even when you get things wrong it's way they would rather get deeper and deeper and dig their heels in because that is they've built their identity around this. So if they get something wrong, they're not just going to say, you know what, these last 10 years of my life, I was a complete moron, a complete idiot. I'm going to disavow it. For an ego protection mechanism, it's much easier just to be like, well, I know the, the key information and you don't. And I'm going to get deeper into my delusion so that I don't have to tell myself I've basically been an idiot and living my life off completely groundless ideas for the last few years. Do you plan on doing any more cult episodes? You don't have to say who, but I'm curious. I would love to. Again, it's about getting inside access. A lot of those cults are aware, like Scientology, it is not easy. There was the YouTuber oh, named yeah. Reck Reckless Ben who did a great expose by wearing spy glasses and getting hidden audio. But a lot of these places are very well guarded. Uh, a piece that I'm working on that I would consider decently cult-like would be Kenneth Copeland, the mega church pastors. Uh, I, I kind of did some infiltration there and I'm working with another guy that has done some great investigative work in that space. So I would love to do more and more exposés about those type of people. And if any of them actually want to invite me in so I can just film openly, please send the invitation. I would love to go. But yes, it's, it's, given how much time i have to work on each piece i mean we're on a quick treadmill i put out a 30 plus minute piece every single week which to do that to pull that off is a great effort on the team and so to to do that to get embedded with a call is very difficult yeah absolutely um so actually when we're talking about 
cults and you know the expose videos on them and you know the people that you've interviewed you know you're not really doing like a gotcha type journalism but yeah. have you ever been targeted at all by individuals like you know because i know some cults do go after people right well here's the thing is once you start to go after some of these big fish it does it is a little bit scary so one there's there's stories that i would like to do that really rich entities that are doing bad things and are known for lawsuits they can come after you so it's almost not worth getting into it because they can drown you out so i i, I recently got insurance that hopefully would protect me against that but i'm not entirely confident because a lot of insurance companies when it actually comes down to it just find like small details in the policy to kick you out um, i just talked to a hacker yesterday that was telling me things that were like I didn't even want to know some of these things and to expose some of it. Like you don't want to get permanently blacklisted. So I think wait, what was it? What was it like the topic? Uh to be honest, <laughs> it's too let's just say powerful intelligence agencies blackmailing leaders into doing certain things because they have leverage on them. And I think some of those pieces will have to wait till I'm independently wealthy and not have to worry about the consequences of tackling them i think uh i think julian beat us in one thing the the record for mentioning epstein uh because he in the first episode because you're you're talking about this so you know with that being said you know when we're talking about that sort of a conversation um if you're okay with going there uh with, yeah with epstein Here's something that most people don't talk about. His guard, the guard, the people that guarded him, that like the guards that didn't do anything, they're still alive and out there. Um, I don't, and they're actually still working at a prison, um, which is crazy to me. And the only charges that they got were like minor negligence charges. Then they ultimately amounted to like fines. Like it was a total joke. Which then they guess that those guys are afraid for their life. Well, why would they be? They haven't said anything. Who's interviewed them? If they spoke that like i'm guessing that they've been visited by shadowy characters that have said look if you want your nice little life here's your new car here's your new job just be quiet and you're gonna have a very nice pleasant life if you're not i, I mean i would guess i would guess well i find it just so crazy to me because i i'm like why is nobody try talking to these people i like that and i wrote that down i'm gonna have to see if my one of my guys can help track them down yeah, I mean, there's two of them. Um, one is named like Orion something. Um, you can you can look it up. Two guards, but nobody's talked to them, and I find that really interesting that nobody's talked to the guards that are the only people that realistically know what Ep that happened to Epstein. The George, only I like people. The way you think? I like the way you think, George. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps perhaps we can bounce some ideas off. But here's the thing. This is the thing that's a little scary about the can of worms. Is depending on who you find out. But let's say you expose the Epstein list. Uh, like how powerful can you get blacklisted permanently off of YouTube? Can you get erased off of different social media platforms? Can you be killed? Can you, like how bad, how deep can it go depending on who you find out and who you expose? And at the end of the day, that's like the pinnacle of journalism is under right. uncovering a story that is scary to uncover and that is, a necessary truth for the people to know but there is great risk in that as well the and fact that this isn't the biggest story of the century and that this isn't something that journalists are just digging into left and right from the mainstream media shows a lot about the holes in the game right now and that's why independent journalists are shining is because people are hungry they're thirsty for just a semblance of transparency and truth and they just think that we're so dumb that it'll just we'll just forget about it or get swept under the rug, no explanation needed. It's just is uh, I'm rooting for the people that can produce the truth. And maybe I need well, to not, not up and do it, even though a lot of bad things can come with it. Let's let's not forget about the diddler. The diddler who's come out recently. And this is what's shocking to me as well. And I know I'm going on these tangents of what's so shocking to me. But TMZ, for years, they have more cameras than anybody else in the history of mankind. And yet they don't know about the Diddy parties. This is all new to people. Like, everybody knew this whole time. And he was such a bad guy. And it's only coming out now. There's quite a lot of overlap between the two. 
Epstein and, and Diddy. So I think either trail, if looked upon enough, would produce very interesting findings. You know, they have some archival footage that would be worth getting your hands on. One day. One day. One day the truth will prevail. All right. Well, I think this was a good place to end off. Um, any final words to the audience? Thank you guys for tuning in. I think especially if a lot of you are part of the younger generations that we are on this quest that does not have as many boundaries anymore. You don't need a degree. You don't need a certification. You don't need the corporation to back you up. You can be the next journalist. You can be the next podcaster. You can be the next person that brings truth and light to the world. So thank you for having me on. No problem. I'm going to stop the recording. We'll talk a little bit after the show. All right.